All righty, so we are going to finish, not finish, we're going to at least continue um, the material we were talking about yesterday, which is in software integrals. And um, the first thing we're going to do is probably pretty obvious. I mean, we looked, we looked at integrals that look like this with a vertical asymptote down here. And we defined these in terms of a limit. And to reiterate what we're doing here, if we have a curve like this with a vertical asymptote speaking, if we have a curve with a vertical asymptote here, and we've got our other end point B, then to have this vertical asymptote, whatever the curve is doing must ultimately climb up the vertical asymptote like this. And the thing is that this curve never hits the vertical asymptote. There's always a space between the curve and the asymptote. So this region goes up infinitely far. It is in that sense an infinite region. And the idea that an infinite region might have a finite area because remember, that's, that's what the integral from A to B is in this case. It's the area under the curve. That's interesting, or I think it's interesting. And the way we're looking at this infinite area is we say, okay, let's look at this area. This area is clearly finite. And now let's move N a little closer to the vertical asymptote. This area still finite. Move N closer to the vertical asymptote. This area still finite. So we let this N get closer and closer to that vertical asymptote. And we look at those finite areas and we look at where they go in the limiting case. And there are two options. This limit might not exist. This area might just get bigger and bigger and bigger and not go anywhere. On the other hand, the limit might exist. This could be a finite number. And if you recall our terminology, if this limit exists, we say that the integral converges. <laughs> if the integral, if the limit, I should say, doesn't exist, we say the integral <laughs> diverges. 
And we saw an example of both of these things yesterday. Like we looked at something like, I'm not going to remember the details perfectly, but we looked at something like the integral from zero to 10,000 of 10,000 plus bizarrely, I do remember the details perfectly. We looked at this integral and we computed the limit on the previous frame and we found that the limit was infinite. This integral diverges. On the other hand, we also looked at the integral from zero to one of one over the square root of x dx. And we found that this integral was finite. In fact, we found that it equaled two. And again, both of these are improper. Zero gives a division by zero error in both these cases. Um, so these are both improper integrals. One diverges, one converges. <laughs> so as I said, or as I think I said, I mean, the first bit of generalization we're going to do is pretty obvious, I think. Suppose we have an integral from A to B, f of x dx, and suppose that this B, is a vertical asymptote. Well, you can, you could probably, if you took a second or two, figure this out by yourself. It's still a limit. Now we are replacing this upper limit with n but this generalization is is a pretty natural generalization i think And I mean, just like in the previous case, this limit can exist, this limit cannot exist. Let's do maybe a kind of, we didn't do any really intricate examples yesterday. I won't call this super intricate. But let's look at the limit from zero to one of x minus one. And let me say yeah, yeah, this is something we'll do. X minus one times x minus two. Let's do a small little partial fraction thing. X minus one times X minus two. And let's put something up there. Let's put an X up there.
So, I mean, I already uttered the phrase partial fractions, but this looks like partial fractions. It's a rational function. We've the denominator is coming pre-factored for us, so that's nice. Um, as far as taking the antiderivative, as I say, this looks like partial fractions, but uh, the new twist on this is that if you take that upper limit and you plug it in here, you get to zero, and the whole thing gives you a division by zero error. So this um, rational expression has a vertical asymptote at one. We can take a quick look at the graph. Um, x minus one, x minus two. Where's the share hiding? And we are interested in what happens between the limits of integration. So we're integrating from zero to one. And we look at this thing, and I have not lied to you. X equals one is indeed a vertical asymptote. So this limit might exist or it might not. It could be finite or it could be infinite. And at this point in time, we don't need to worry, maybe never in this course, do we need to worry about, de about developing sort of intuition. Like, do I think this limit exists or not? It, it doesn't matter because we're going to just use the definition and either we'll get a finite number or we won't. Uh, draw. The limit. Technically, these are one-sided limits like n is going to one from below, but that's not really, that's not going to affect anything in any of these problems. We can just say the limit as n approaches one, the integral from zero to n of x divided by x minus one, times x minus two dx. And it's important to write this down. I mean, this sort of, because of the way quiz, I mean, you can also turn in your homework and end paper now if, um, if you've wanted to do that. But because of the way the online quizzes work, we sometimes lose notation. Like, I can't see how you're writing the integral down on your scrap paper. But it is important in mathematics to be in need. Like, last time I taught this course, I'd have students drop, not bother to write that. And I mean, they take the limit at the end of the problem. It's not like they didn't realize it was a limit. They just think, oh, well, writing this down is tedious. I'll make my life less tedious. I mean, the issue is that without this limit, this, you know, this equality just isn't true. I mean, why should those things be equal? 
So we do want to be neat in, in mathematics. And no doubt we want to be neat in all academic fields, but especially mathematics. So for the moment, let's leave most of this problem behind. Let's not worry about the zero or the n or the limit. Let's just take a look at to this integral, this indefinite integral. And see if we can find it. And as I say earlier, and I, I mean, as I hope you recognize, even if I didn't say it, this is a classic partial fraction. We've got a rational function. Just because I didn't want the problem to linger. I even went so far as to refactor the denominator for you. We can break this fraction apart into the sum of simpler fractions. We will find A and we'll <laughs> find B. Um, we will use the heavy side method to do that, which, as we hopefully recall, is to multiply both sides of the equality by that denominator. And you get a bunch of, a bunch of cancellation. You get A times X minus two plus B times X minus one. And then we select values of X that turn expressions to zero. So we can let X be a two and we get two equals B. Um, expanding on that, if we let X be two, that turns to zero, two minus one, turns to one, so we get x equals, um, we let x be two over here as well, so two equals b. I have to be careful not to erase stuff accidentally, but being able to just scribble stuff out and erase the scribbles is a great power. If we let x be one, now we got one there. This turns to zero. One minus two is negative one. So one equals negative A and A is negative one. So there's our, there's our decomposition. That's negative one, that's two. And this integral, this indefinite integral, is 
is the indefinite integral of negative one over x minus one plus two over x minus two. Does this look good to everyone so far? I'm always alive to the idea that I might make little errors, but I feel pretty good about this. So, both of these when we integrate them give us natural logarithms. And since I'm using the indefinite integral notation, let me write down my constant of integration as well. <laughs> Great, so what have we accomplished? Well, now that we found this indefinite integral, we can use what we have, we can use that indefinite integral and the fundamental theorem of calculus to find that definite integral. The integral from zero to n of x divided by x minus one times x minus two equals the negative natural log of the absolute value of x minus one plus two ln x minus two. <clears throat> evaluated from zero to n. So I mean, I do understand the urge to to make stuff simpler and just not write steps down. Um, this is getting a little tedious, but we'll plug in n and we'll plug in zero. The negative natural logarithm of n minus one plus two times the natural logarithm of n minus two minus, and now we plug in zero, and these absolute values are absolutely essential because the natural log of negative one and negative two wouldn't be defined. So it's, as I, as I said, like five seconds ago, I guess I sometimes repeat myself, we need these natural logarithms. And now that we have found this, we can take the limit as n approaches one, and this limit will either exist or it won't, and the integral will either um, converge or diverge. And maybe here, maybe. 
be out. Let's separate that and let me not mean to turn, do that. Let me not copy this whole thing again. Let's just take the limit as n approaches one and see what happens. And you might end up having to use Desmos or something, depending on how comfortable you are working with whatever function we have here, depending on how comfortable we are working with limits. I mean, I can just say what's going to happen. I mean, as n approaches one, This will approach negative one. This will approach zero. The natural logarithm has a vertical asymptote at zero. So this is going to infinity or maybe to negative infinity, but it's going to some kind of infinite value. And we have an infinite value and a bunch of finite stuff added and subtracted, and the result is still an infinite value. But as I say, if your, I mean, limits in calculus one was at this point a long time ago, maybe you go to Desmos and you just look at this thing. And Desmos, let's see, apparently nothing I can do to Desmos is gonna Also, anyone watching this recording, bear with me a bit. Well, let's share. Why is this most giving me this? parentheses around this. Is Desmos seriously not recognizing absolute value symbols? Man, I, I am disappointed and I'm also baffled because surely there we can have absolute value. If we write y equals, we can have the, I have no idea what, uh, what this issue is that's caused Desmos to behave this way. Error. What if we put these in parentheses? Okay, Desmos likes that. So the negative natural log of n minus one Sorry about that. I have no idea what, why Desmos needed those parentheses, but plus two times the natural log of n minus two. Plus two times the natural log of n minus two. Mm. 
minus minus this. Um, the net this is a zero, but I can just type this into Desmos. I'll have to keep going back. Do I have their dry erase markers in the room? If there were, I could, but there aren't. Okay, I can just go back and forth. Minus, and then in parentheses. The negative log of one. as I love this utility. It sometimes aggravates me, but the negative log of one plus twice the log of two. Okay, and if you're following along, at home, I'm pretty sure you, yeah. Uh, if you just type this, Desmos is a little odd. You can just type like X and it will intuit that, okay, X is your um, independent variable. What you really mean is Y equals X. If you just type this, it won't, intuit that n is our variable, but if we type y equals, then Desmos will understand that y is our variable. And we're taking the limit as x approaches one. And we see that as x approaches one, we are climbing up this vertical asymptote. And at this point, Desmos continuing to be as annoying as possible today, won't let me go any further up the asymptote. But if we zoom out, we can see that, yeah, this green curve is just climbing up this asymptote forever. It's going to infinity. Yeah. So this limit, when we have this asymptote here, is infinite. And I mean, that's what, that's what I said, that this was going to go to infinity. We were going to have a bunch of other stuff that was going to just be finite numbers. And this limit is infinite. And having an infinite limit. Let's see, where did I first write this example down? Here. Trying to erase, there we go. Let's also, this thing sort of periodically becomes really thin. Let's get a bit of thickness to this. This integral diverges. The area under this curve is infinite. Let's have you do an example. I always want to do more of that and then sort of the practical realities of having to get stuff done on time, get in the way. 
Let's see if we have. One over the square root of X minus one. And this is going to be like we did yesterday. Our vertical asymptote is down there. Why don't you come shoot this limit for me and then we'll go over it and maybe it's just, um, well, I'm going to spend all week on this section. Uh, that's fine. So in terms of just taking the integral. This can either maybe be done mentally or maybe be done as a small u substitution, depending on how confidently you feel. I mean, if you do a u substitution, then du equals dx, and this becomes one over the square root of u du, no mus, no fuss. And then you, you have to remember, I can never do this in my head. I have to write down that one over the square root of u is u to the negative one half power. And then I can go, okay, negative one half. If we bump that up by one, it becomes positive one half. Dividing by positive one half is the same as multiplying by two. So two times X minus one to the one half plus C and the one half Power is the um, square root. And then once we've done this, well, I guess we're not quite ready to take the limit, but let me write the limit down. We're taking the limit as n approaches one, the integral from n to 10, one over the square root of x minus one dx. So as I say, we're not ready to take the limit, but now that we know the antiderivative, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate this integral. The integral from one to 10, one over the square root of x minus one dx is, this antiderivative evaluated from one to 10. No, ah, uh, sorry about that. We replaced one with this n. So let me correct that both those places. So n, 
is the square root of nine, 10 minus one is nine, minus two times the square root of n minus one. And now that we have this, we can finish the problem off. We can take the limit as n approaches one. So the limit as n approaches one of this is six, six minus two times the square root of n minus one. Well, everything is continuous here. We can just plug one in, we get to zero. 6 minus 2 times the square root of 0. So this infinite region has a finite area. And in fact, it's equal to 6. So as I said, but maybe I was sort of rambling, um, improper integrals, the section is kind of two unrelated parts. We'll finish this material up tomorrow. And then, sorry, but we're, I, I understand the temptation to not be here the last day before uh, spring break. I hope maybe this being a Thursday class helps temper that uh, temptation, but we have important stuff to do Thursday. Thursday, we're going to be looking at integrals where instead of having two finite numbers, one of the limits of integration is infinite. And we'll talk about this and we'll talk about applications. This is a really important subject um, in terms of applications. So that's the plan for the rest of the week. Finish this section up, very long section.